CV. En dan dit. Geschilderde portretten van vorsten of staatshoofden. Of het nou gaat om officiële statieportretten of om vrij werk... het leidt altijd wel tot pittige discussies. Het komt namelijk maar zelden voor dat werkelijk iedereen enthousiast is... over wat de kunstenaar op het doek heeft gezet. Of het nou gaat om de koning of om de koningin. Over smaak valt nu eenmaal niet te twisten. Maar er zijn uitzonderingen op die regel van sterk uiteenlopende waardering. Dat geldt bijvoorbeeld voor het officiële portret van de Engelse koningin Elisabeth. Dat werd gemaakt ter gelegenheid van het feit dat ze 60 jaar op de troon zat. Dat schilderij van Ralf Heijmans kreeg bijna uitsluitend juichende kritieken. Heijmans, geboren in Australië. Zoon van een Nederlandse vader en een Franse moeder. Hij plaatste de Queen terug op de plek waar ze 60 jaar eerder gekoond was in Westminster Abbey. We zochten Ralf op in Londen, waar hij tegenwoordig woont met vrouw Tammy en hun dochters Ellie Rose en Hannah. We waren nog niet binnen of het gesprek kwam zo snel op gang dat ze misschien iets te lang in de hal bleven staan. Het was niet anders. London is the place for me. London is the place to be. Go to Japan or America, China, India or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Londen. Hier kwam Ralf Heijmans terecht, na behoorlijk wat omzwervingen. Na zijn middelbare school studeerde Heijmans korte tijd kunst en wiskunde. Voelde voor een baan in de architectuur. Maar al snel besloot hij dat hij naar Europa wilde. Belandde aanvankelijk in Parijs. Hij kreeg daar al behoorlijk grote opdrachten om belangrijke mannen en vrouwen te portretteren. Voor hij verhuisde naar een rustige woonwijk in Zuid-Londen. Hier woont en werkt hij, de 42-jarige Heijmans. In zijn huis Annex Atelier was hij een half jaar lang dag en nacht bezig... met wat hij, zo jong als hij is, nu al beschouwt als zijn levenswerk... The Portrait of the Queen. Hallo. Rolf. Hi. Rolf Heijmans. Hallo. Is een very Dutch name for an Australian painter. Absolutely. How come? Well, my father's Dutch and, uh, and I'm Dutch, so... Ja, yeah, half Dutch. Well, yeah. I'm yeah, fully Dutch in yeah. my opinion. Dit is Rolfs vader Frank Heijmans. Geboren in Brabant, opgegroeid in Australië. Woont in Sydney, waar Ralf ook ter wereld kwam. Maar er was heel wat aan vooraf gegaan, voordat het gezin Heijmans hier terecht kwam. Het is een familie met een rijke historie die heel ver teruggaat. De beide wereldoorlogen hebben diepe sporen nagelaten. Zo zaten opa en oma Heijmans tijdens de Duitse bezetting twee jaar lang in Brabant ondergedoken. So literally they were hidden by a Catholic family in the south. So my grandfather was a shoe designer. He had a shoe factory in Osterbeek, a slipper factory. And then they moved to, they were hidden in Tilburg nearby uh, by a, a brother and sister, a Catholic brother and sister. And they were in hiding for two years. We're very lucky to survive. And during that time, my father was born in hiding. So it was, a, it was an extraordinary experience, you know, literally delivering a birth in an attic yeah. in hiding during the Second World War. It's dramatic. And, you know, he was very lucky to have lived. He was very malnourished and, uh, and was very lucky to have survived. Yeah. Vader Frank Heijmans vertelde nog vaak hoe zijn vader na de oorlog het initiatief nam om Nederland te verlaten toen hij zelf nog een peuter was. Zoals het zoveel Nederlanders verging in die eerste jaren na de bevrijding, was er ook bij het gezin Heijmans de angst dat het misschien toch niet allemaal voorgoed voorbij zou zijn. Daarom vertrokken in die tijd meer dan 400.000 Nederlanders naar elders en kwam er een emigratiegolf op gang naar met name Canada en Australië met voor iedereen de hoop op een nieuw veilig bestaan. I think everyone was a little worried that the world might turn back into wartime, uh, you know, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and there was a lot going on at the time that was uh, creating conflict, and so they thought, let's make a new life. It was a period of time where a lot of Dutchmen went to Canada or Australia. That's right. There were two destinations. We also have some family history because uh, we have a, a great, great uncle, Eli, Eli Heimans, who wrote Willem Roda, okay. which is a story which is still in print, I think, for kids, boys' story. Who, about a, a little boy who went to Australia. Yeah. So there was some fascination in the family for Australia and some of the, the you know, the, the exotic nature of it. Uh, Did he tell you about the war? Oh, my, very, yes. Yeah. I have lots of stories about the war. Uh, uh, yeah. What specific story can you recall? Oh, many. But they were hidden by a cabinet maker, so who literally survived during the war by um, making cabinets for the German soldiers. So there were constantly soldiers uh, in the house. 
you know, collecting their, 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 so it was like very tense. They were literally upstairs. Yeah. Um, and uh, there were sightings um, by certain, you know, people in the house, by neighbours. It's a series of lucky coincidences that none of those people said anything. So, I mean, really, it's a, it's a great testament to how uh, extremely tolerant and, um, you know, the, the Dutch community was. They were really protected by the priest, by, by the whole community. Ralf, middelste in een gezin van drie kinderen. Zoon van Frank, maker van documentaires. Hoe jong die ook was, al snel werd duidelijk dat Ralf een opvallend talent had. Maar die eerste jaren in Australië waren verre van gemakkelijk. Opa kon bijvoorbeeld zijn schoenen aan de straatstenen niet kwijt. Hij had niets. They struggled, you know, they were in a house with no electricity and it was nobody like the shoes that my grandfather designed. They were too sophisticated. <laughs> in Australia, there were two types of shoes, you know, and, and his shoes were like, you know, without laces, he did moccasins, yeah. <laughs> slippers. <laughs> yeah. Didn't work. Right? They didn't work, so he did odd jobs. And so they, they struggled. They opened a cafe. They, they did what they could. In the meantime, the children had very good educations. And then my, my father uh, became a filmmaker. Uh, my uncle. So in the end, everything went better. Everything went better, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but um, it was a hard life. I think, that, yeah, once you go through that. Uh, but you said, I had a good upbringing. Is there some sort of Dutch element in the way you were brought up? Oh, very much. My Severe, has... for example? No, no, no. Oh, look, my, my grandmother, memories of my grandmother are extraordinary. I, I, and, and I recently heard some of the tapes that were recorded of her stories during the war, which are amazing. Um, but, you know, very much Dutch values. You know, she'd come in without saying hello, pick up a broom, start sweeping. Before saying anything, do you know what I mean? She, she was, they were very, very Dutch. And, uh, um, you know, very warm and lovely. But, you know, all of this came into my art more than anything. Yeah. So, although sadly I don't speak Dutch, I have a, a very uh, strong affinity for Holland and it, my, my art speaks Dutch. From a visual point of view, you're speaking Dutch to Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Uh, through your paintings. 100%. Ralf's schilderijen onderscheiden zich vaak door een strak lijnenspel. Te danken aan de korte periode dat hij ambities had om verder te gaan als architect. Hij mag dan onze taal niet meester zijn. Inderdaad, in zijn stijl van schilderen herken je alleen al qua belichting en compositie veel van de grote meesters uit de 16e en 17e eeuw. Mensen portretteren, dat is zijn grote kracht. Maar altijd in een omgeving die meteen het verhaal vertelt over wie ze zijn en wat ze doen. Hij heeft nog familie in Amsterdam en in zijn werk weet hij zich schatplichtig aan de stijl van Rembrandt en Vermeer. Dat zie je opnieuw duidelijk aan deze drie portretten van Scandinavische thriller-auteurs. Waaraan hij net de laatste hand gelegd heeft. Ze zijn onderdeel van een nieuwe expositie. So you're not Dutch, but... Uh, in, the, in your work, yes. there's a, a, an enormous influence of, let's oh. say, the Dutch masters. Absolutely. Can I say that? Absolutely. I mean, this is very early days, a few days' work on this one, but this uh, will be a portrait of Ben Kingsley. Uh, so I recently spent a week with him in Morocco on location, and we had a concept that we were working on together for a portrait. Um, so, too early to tell, but you get a sense of how I build up my canvas, which is very Dutch from a very warm imprimatura yeah. and then a series of glazers so very much inspired by you're a tradition. contemporary 16th century dutch painter aren't you <laughs> ralf mengt zijn eigen verf volgens oud recept werkt met oude technieken maar toch zijn zijn portretten zeer eigentijds is goed deels te danken aan dat verhalende element in zijn schilderijen dat als zeer apart wordt ervaren hoe die te werk gaat, kun je mooi zien aan de voorbereiding voor het grote schilderij van de beroemde Russische dirigent en pianist Vladimir Askenazi. Bij Heijmans is de basis altijd een foto. Maar die moet dan wel uit een ideale hoek genomen zijn. Hij had een bijzondere reden waarom hij juist Askenazi wilde portretteren. He's an extraordinary musician. He gives a lot in his music. But also his connection to Australia is one of the heart because his son had a water skiing accident and lost a limb. And there was a, one microsurgeon at the time who could, you know, was the expert and he was Australian. He came in from Australia, fixed up his son. And, from, and then he said, what can I do to repay you? And he said, come to Australia and do a few concerts. And, so, he, did. and he did. So his connection with Australia is one of love. And, uh, and so, so hence the gesture of the hand on the heart. 
Als je zo duidelijk beïnvloed bent door de Dutch Masters, moet je toch tenminste één echt favoriet schilderij hebben. The most beautiful Dutch painting is the Jewish bride for me. It, when I saw it at the, the Can you explain there, why? Uh, maybe you can't, because that's the, the beauty of art is that there's this mystery magical quality, but it has something, there's an extraordinary intimacy, uh, an amazing quality, textual quality in that painting, but it's really the, the quality of light. Rembrandt is able to transform paint into light, yeah. like, like a magician. Is there a number two also? Uh, well, it might be the painting at the end, <laughs> the night watch, <laughs> yeah, yeah. because it's magnificent. It's, it's, I think it's for portraits, it really, that was the first major painting that took portraiture out of its restraints. And it, so a scene, which might have been uh, a, a casual grouping of figures, became an event and has this mysterious quality that is it's magnetic. Details, zoals dat nauwelijks zichtbare oog achterin van Rembrandt zelf, dat maakt dat Ralf zo enthousiast is over dit schutterstuk. From his grave, Rembrandt says, thank you, yeah. very nice. And is he paying for the painting? How does it work? Well, this is a collaboration. Okay. Mostly I do paintings that are um, co private commissions. Because you're working six months on it, a year from time to time? Yes. Yeah, so but is it boring, working for a year on the same no, portrait? No, it's a labor of love. It's a labor of love. You're so not coming into the door mornings at six o'clock and say, Jesus, we're the, again the same painting. <laughs> no. I can't bend Kingsley. No, uh, no, no. I'm very patient. I'm impatient in every other aspect of my life. But with painting, I have infinite patience. Dat hij voor dit soort werk normaal gesproken bedragen kan vragen tot zo'n 150.000 euro, kom mede door zijn droomopdracht. Die Ralph vooral ook te danken had aan het portret dat hij jaren eerder maakte van de Deense kroonprinses Mary. Then suddenly you're the talk of the town because you get commissioned to make the portrait of the Queen for the Diamond Jubilee. Yeah, that was amazing. What was your first reaction? Uh, let's, a bit of panic, because it was in 10 days. I had 10 days notice, so I had to prepare. Are you free in March, I think it was, wasn't <laughs> That's it? That's right, I was in Australia. It was late February, I got on a plane. I said, right, I'm coming to London. If this happens, it happens. I need to be prepared. I had this big vision for the painting, and that was to set the Queen in Westminster Abbey where she was crowned. Being the Diamond Jubilee, there's no better place. No, no, you know, that's the most significant place. Buckingham Palace wasn't beautiful enough? Yes, but not meaningful enough for this. I think, the, you know, the Diamond Jubilee is a milestone. Only one other Queen has ever... You know, that was your first reaction. What was your secondary reaction? After nerves, the panic. Nerves. Yeah. On a scale from one to ten? <laughs> ten. Yeah, no, really? Yeah. Yes, but but everything everything fell away when I met her. But but yes, it was it was nerve wracking because you have I had one hour with the Queen and I was lucky to get that hour because no other artist got any time with her during the Diamond Jubilee, you know, being extremely busy. So it had to be well choreographed and planned. Yeah. You went off to Buckingham Palace and there she was. There she was, was she a good sitter? She was a great sitter. Yeah. I don't think you she can find quiet. a better sitter. <laughs> yeah. Did she wear what she wanted? You yes. wanted her to wear? Yes. So she wore. That was a surprise, probably, or not? It was. There was a sense of surprise because we were told before that she wouldn't be able to put the robe on, which requires four footmen to carry it. It's you know 18 foot long. Um, it weighs God knows how heavy. So it was a big. Uh, but then we were told just before the sitting she will wear it, and so we were we, you know we were thrilled. Jewelry. Oh, the, the full works, those are Queen Victoria's diamonds, which are, I think, the greatest diamonds she owns. They were given to Queen Victoria on her coronation. And what were you wearing? <laughs> the only unusual thing about what I was wearing was a tie. So That's the what first I said. Time, yeah. <laughs> the first time I wore a tie. You can't show her your hair. <laughs> huh? That's right. No. <laughs> so I was on my best behavior. <laughs> and could you direct her? Say, could you look yes. into that, that, that direction, for example? Uh, it was difficult. I was given the, the correct uh, protocol, how to address the Queen. I was said, um, you must say, uh, may I take control now, ma'am? And I, I couldn't really bring myself to say that. I mean, try saying that to the, the Queen of England. It's quite difficult. Yeah. But she got the point. Zegt Queen Elizabeth, en je hebt het meteen over het strengst denkbare protocol. Dat Michelle Obama een arm om haar heen legde, nou, vooruit. Maar dat de Australische premier Julia Gillard bij de verwelkoming van de koningin geen hoed droeg, schande. En dat haar voorganger Paul Keating tijdens een bezoek aan de Queen zei dat het koningschap totaal uit de tijd was... Onvergeeflijk. En dat hij ook nog iets te intiem was bij Prins William. Helemaal not done. The people around her must have been afraid because uh, when you see on the internet, Australians don't seem to have a very good track record <laughs> as it comes to royal protocol. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you are an exception to the rule, I probably. Am. And I happen to be uh, know quite well the prime minister who for whom that that uh, expression is made famous. But 
No, I was very well briefed on uh, on correct protocol. Yeah, and and it's very important. And, yeah, and she was. You she were was a nice perfect. guy there. I was a very nice guy, and and it was an important painting, you know, to signify the diamond. Why did they ask you to do that? Every painter would love to make that portrait on the diamond jubilee. We, we can never interpret. England. We can never interpret what decisions are made by who and for what reason. No, uh, but I felt very, very privileged. Out. I felt very privileged. The strange thing is, she's looking at the floor. Yes. Yeah. Why? Well, where she is looking is the very spot where every monarch has been crowned for the past nine hundred years. So it's a very, uh, it's the most, it's the epicenter of the British monarchy, that yeah. spot. Yeah. So it's very significant. And also, I wanted this to be clearly a time of reflection, a sort of reflective painting, which is unlike any other royal portrait that you would see. From a distance, it's quite magnificent and grand, but when you come in close and you see her expression, there's a touch of sadness, a soulfulness, yeah. you know, a little bit Rembrandt yeah, she's inspired. A bit sad there. She is a bit sad. She is a bit sad. Yeah. I think, I think that's Despite how... the fact that in, in the last few months you see her smiling and even laughing everywhere. That's right. Yeah. But I think those... Maybe after the painting she's in a better mood. <laughs> Apparently she was very happy with it. But what was very intriguing was that the, um, the Dean of Westminster Abbey saw that painting and his first reaction was, I've seen that face on the Queen when she's in prayer in the Abbey. You've captured something that uh, no one else has been able to capture. So, which is amazing. So, yeah. yeah. Het werd een schilderij van 2,5 bij 3,5 meter. Met een eenzame vorstin. Het is een heel powerful symbolic moment. Het is een imagined moment. Je zult nooit de queen op haar eigen 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 Then it was vandalized in 2013. Why was that? Well, you must have slept very badly. It was. It was. It was a very, very troubling time um, to go through that. It was very nerve-wracking. Um, so what happened was a man was making a political protest, and uh, why with this painting? Well, it's the Queen. She's sacred, but it's also art, and it's also at the Abbey. So he really, it was going to attract a lot of attention to his to his cause. So I think that's why he targeted the Queen. I mean. There's nothing more sacred in this in this culture. Echtgenote Tammy is de stille kracht achter het succes van Manlief. Accepteerde zonder morgen dat Ralph tijdens de productie van het portret van de Queen 10, 12, soms 14 uur achtereen niet aanspreekbaar was. Ook op dagen waarop de mussen van het dak vielen, zat hij binnen, zwoegend en zwetend. Want waar hij normaal gesproken een jaar neemt voor een portret, daar moest de bestelling nu binnen zes maanden ten paleis worden afgeleverd. Ook de kleine Hannah en Ellie Rose begrepen dat papa even iets anders aan zijn hoofd had dan voorlezen of een bezoek aan de zoo. Voor hij settelde, was Heimans rusteloos op zoek naar een plek waar hij kon aarden. Die route bracht hem van Australië via Parijs uiteindelijk naar Londen. So you've come a long way in your young life. Australia, Paris, London. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and it's been a great journey. Yeah, absolutely. Is this a surprise to you? Uh, well, no. Um, this is how I would hope things would turn out. Yeah. No, I, I mean, of course, it's always a surprise to get a commission to paint the Queen, because I wrote a, a list. I, I found an old list of people I wanted to paint from ten years ago, and the Queen was number one. So it's a very is nice feeling so? to be able to tick that one off the list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And who, who's still on the list? Ah, there are many people. Uh, nice to do the Clintons. They, they look like they could be some very important people coming up. Yeah. Um, some great statesmen, you know. I was just thinking, you know, it'd be great to do the likes of Kissinger or, or Gorbachev. Yeah. You know, these people are timeless, you know, they're part of our history. And just portraits, just interested in people, no landscapes here. No, I'm very much a portrait painter. I, I, I feel that's where my particular, you know, passion lies. And from the beginning on already? It has, yeah, from early on, yeah. yeah. I love exploring the psychology of people and, and telling their story through, you know, through the setting and, and that, that is my, yeah, my great love. And we see the work of the next generation already. <laughs> Are they as talented as their father? They're very talented children. <laughs> they have multi-talented. <laughs> We're still working out where their the, the specific talents lie, but it's wonderful raising children. It's the most incredible yeah. experience. And they never ask you, what are you doing there 12, 14, 16, 18 hours at a time? They, they have this concept of me working. It's a mystery for them to come into the studio. It's like, you know, walk, walking into a magical garden or something. You know, their, their eyes are wide open and... Yeah. It's um, they love they love coming in watching and 
you know, they love, because I, I play music when I paint, always classical music, so they love dancing around and so it's, it's kind of slightly panicky. Oh, isn't that, that's a movie. Your kids <laughs> dancing while you're painting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the maximum one can, can ask from this life. Exactly. These are, uh, let's say, heavy commissions. Yes. Uh, you have two very young children who keep you awake already, but this also <laughs> must keep you awake from time to time, or not? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's all consuming. Re relaxed, but it's, it's a tough job for you. It's very tough. There's a lot of... Uh, you work in a very detailed manner. Yes. You prepare everything. Yes. I'm working to deadlines because people have particular requirements for portraits, which is a hard thing to, uh, to marry. You but know. your eyes still smile. Yes, absolutely. No, I love it. I love it. It's my passion. Because your life is moving into the right direction. Yes. No, yeah. Wife, two beautiful kids. Yes. And this work. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't be happier.